We're going to talk about two different genera tonight. Uh, the Cantharellus genus is the solid bodied chanterelles. Those are the ones that have solid uh, stalks, the ones you'll be looking for, I guess, as early as next week. Um, they are mostly yellow and orange, not always, but mostly. Uh, and the fertile surface, the underside of the cap, uh, is going to uh, be uh, usually at least somewhat wrinkled. And sometimes uh, those wrinkles look like gills, but they aren't. And that's going to be critical for those of you who are new. So I'm going to start right there. Uh, but before we get there, uh, the other genus I'm going to go through tonight in some detail is craterellus. These are the trumpets. These are the hollow bodied chanterelles, the most famous being the black trumpet, which you will also be looking for shortly. Um, the fertile surface there is also uh, smooth to wrinkled, but these things are, are thin tubes usually, kind of like the old timey uh, uh, palace trumpets. Uh, long and skinny and hollow all the way down generally. Um, the difference between gills and false gills. This is the most critical thing for beginners to learn because there are plenty of orange mushrooms out there and at least one of them is pretty poisonous. Uh, it isn't going to kill you but it will make you very sick and we're going to meet it in just a minute. Um, you don't want to fry that up and the way that the best way to uh, rule it out so that you don't eat it by mistake, is to look at the difference between these two cross sections of caps. The upper one is the cross section of a cap of a chanterelle. The lower one is a gilled mushroom, which you'll also see in a second. This is a milk mushroom, not the, not the badly poisonous one. But look at the difference in the wrinkles versus gills here. The chanterelle wrinkles are generally pretty short and pretty fat, uh, and often a little bit triangular in cross-section even. Compare that to the gills down below that are many times taller than they are, than they are thick. Uh, that's a ratio to learn to burn into your brain. Uh, I think of the gilled mushrooms when cross-sectioned this way as kind of like Venetian blind slats. If you look at a Venetian blind uh, side on, what you're going to see is something that looks a lot like what you're seeing in the lower picture here. If you see that, it's not going to be a chanterelle. Uh, the, gills are not, uh, the gills are much longer than they are thick compared to chanterelles. The mushroom on the left is the, is the bad one. Uh, uh, it's also really tempting uh, for beginning mushroomers. Uh, this is the jack-o'-lantern. Um, beginners see these and they're, they're in pounds, they're in clumps, they're baskets full. They grow around the base of oak trees. They grow in clumps like this. Um, they have gills, they really do have gills. And Sam tells me, although I haven't done this experiment myself, um, that if you tear one of these from top to bottom, you're gonna see that the flesh inside the stalk is as orange as the uh, outside of the stalk is. With the chanterelle, the flesh in the cap might be kind of orange like you just saw, but the stalk flesh is gonna be a lot whiter uh, regardless of what color the stalk is. Jack-o'-lantern mushrooms are uh, kind of fun in some ways, but eating is not one of them. So uh, get a look at this. Chanterelles don't grow like this. They don't grow in big clumps around oak trees and they certainly do not have gills. The mushroom on the right is the one that gave me trouble when I got started. It is a milk mushroom, uh, but it uh, looks a lot like a chanterelle too. And I didn't at the time really understand the difference between gills and uh, the ridges underneath the caps of chanterelles. So, when I would scratch this, as I did here, and couldn't get it to produce any milk, I would complain to Charlotte Kaplan that this has no right being a milk mushroom, even though she assured me that it was because it didn't produce any milk. And so why couldn't it be a chanterelle? Um, if you learn the difference between gills and ridges, uh, that will no longer be a problem, regardless of whether you can get this thing to milk or not. It's not poisonous. Uh, uh, Lactarius croceus is the name. 
but it doesn't taste good. It's pretty hot. Um, so you wouldn't make the mistake of eating it twice if you did make it once. Here are a couple lookalikes that are a little bit trickier because they don't have actual gills either. They have wrinkles just like chanterelles do. Um, but they're both, and they're both solid bodied. Uh, this looks kind of vase shaped here, but uh, this section down here is good and solid. It's orange on top, so that's okay for chanterelles. It's kind of scaly. Occasionally a chanterelle will do that. These ridges here though, the difference, the easy difference, a way to tell the difference between this and the chanterelle is the ridges go, oops, all the way down. Uh, to the ground, uh, right about there. All of this is ridged. Chanterelles have a stalk section that's free of um, false gills. This thing doesn't. Over here, to raise the degree of difficulty even a little bit more, you have a very rare species um, that does have a stem section and uh, false gills above it. The color is not quite right for a chanterelle. It's kind of a dirty brown color. Um, the flesh is white though. The thing this one does that no chanterelle does, at least not in this part of the world, is bruise purple. Uh, I scratched the false gills here. I don't know if you can see that that's purple, but it is. Uh, and that's part of what makes this look like it's dirty brown. It, it's brown until it starts getting beat up a little bit by the weather and then the purple starts kind of getting into it. Um, this is Glowio cantharellus purpurescens. If you ever see it, you'll be lucky. Uh, it's not edible. It grows around hemlocks, which is another reason to be concerned about it right now. Uh, take lots of pictures if you find it, uh, but uh, leave it in the woods because there ain't many of them out there. So uh, those are some of the main lookalikes. Let's talk now about why chanterelles suddenly got so complicated in the past 10 years. Um, Cantharellus sebarius, the mushroom known in field guides as the golden chanterelle, was originally described in Europe. And when North American mycologists, some of which came from Europe, uh, saw our yellow chanterelles, they thought, all right, okay, so here it is over here too and just called it Cantharellus sebarius. For the past uh, 15, 20 years, um, the uh, intelligentsia in North American mycology have known that, well, ours probably isn't really Cantharellus sebarius, but nobody had done the work yet to identify what the species in North America were uh, or to prove that there wasn't any Cantharellus sebarius here so everybody kind of looked the other way and the field guys went ahead and, and cranked out the name uh, Cantharella Siberius Golden Chanterelle. Then a European mycologist named Bart Bike decided, all right, uh, he'd do it. He'd do the work and he did uh, between about uh, 2011, 2016 and just obliterated uh, Cantharellus sebarius in the United States. It doesn't occur here. None of the specimens uh, that he collected or American mycologists sent to him uh, worked out that way genetically. Uh, and he did go to the trouble of describing a bunch of new species that do occur here. And we're gonna go through a lot of those shortly. Um, new mycologists often ask, well, why the hell did they need to do that? It was fine when it was all Cantharellus sebarius. Uh, and I empathize with that, uh, but in point of fact, they really aren't, uh, and here is why. Molecular mycology. Mycologists have always had to identify mushrooms based on the um, equipment that they had available to sort them out. Originally, that was eyeballs and microscopes. Um, then along came the ability to genetically test uh, individual mushrooms and see who they were related to that way. Um, humans are familiar with that. You've heard of 23andMe and Ancestry.com. Uh, what happens in molecular mycology labs is kind of the same. 
if you're a person that slept through high school biology, I'm going to make this attempt to make this complicated subject uh, overly simple. Um, what molecular mycologists do is that they take the nuclei of cells, and a cell nucleus, if you think about it, is uh, it's composed of chromosomes. But what that really is, is the library, the cell's library of instruction manuals for how to make it. Most of the components of cells have the instructions in the nucleus. And so what molecular mycologists do is they destroy those nuclei, blast them to little pieces, any number of different ways. Uh, and then they send into the soup uh, of the mess they have made uh, little chemical bloodhounds whose job it is to sort out one particular page of all those manuals that got blown up and reduced to loose pages. When the bloodhound who is trained to find just a particular page, no others ignores those completely, when they find that page, they have a very unhound-like uh, ability to duplicate that page. They just make copies after copies after copies. And so the soup fills up over time with mostly those pages to the degree that the uh, molecular mycologist next machine can read that soup, read out the actual letters, DNA code for that one particular page. The page mycologists picked early on, they fondly named the barcode because they thought it was going to be able to differentiate every species from every other. There would be just enough difference between mushroom species that everybody would come out with a different barcode. That sort of kind of worked. Uh, that's the way it was for a long time. Um, here, I, I just want you to see what this code looks like in case you've forgotten over the years. The alphabet uh, in a nucleus, a cell nucleus, has four letters, composed of four letters. That's the entire alphabet, A, G, T, and C. Uh, and it's the sequence of these things that a barcode readout is. Here is, for example, the barcode for two Cantharella species that are found here. Uh, Cantharellus tenuithrix is a close relative of the European Cantharellus siberius, as you'll see in a minute. Uh, Cantharellus altipes or septentrionalis, it's not clear who's going to win that name uh, battle yet, but it's one or the other. There's the barcode for it. Um, I want to draw your attention to the line in green. Here's that line again, just separated from all the rest. And in red, you'll see the places where the lines differ. Uh, there's a group substitution in the first line, and in the second line, there's a single uh, base substituted there, uh, a, a C or a T, depending on which species it is. Mycologists have decided that to belong to the same species, barcodes need to be 97% identical or better. Uh, that's not true for other life forms, but it's the agreed upon standard for at least most fungi. What you see in the tree, the family tree they constructed, Bike constructed out of all of his various uh, barcodes and then put into a statistical package that attempts to draw the ancestral family tree. Um, first thing you're going to recognize is that this doesn't look much like a family tree you've seen before. That's partly because the journal format means they had to lay the thing on its side. The trunk is going to be to the left. Uh, here it's folded down below the asterisk. The first branch uh, is right here. One goes up, one goes down, but the downward going one is bent back up again to fit on the page. And then you have a series of branches. And out at all the branch tips, you have individual specimens who got uh, their barcodes uh, studied. This little group here with the fickle finger of fate, uh, is the Altapes slash Septentrionalis uh, group. Notice that it is out by itself on a branch from the very beginning of this tree. Over here on the right is another big bracketed area that all belong to that other main branch. Down here, 
we have a couple samples of European Cantharella siberius. Notice that they are on different branches than a lot of these, the ones in blue are found in North America. Uh, one of which is Tenuothrix, right here. So Tenuothrix and Siberius are fairly closely related. And even though Altapes looks a lot like a golden chanterelle, it's way out here in left field. And nobody suspected that at all uh, until Bike came along. So um, does that mean it's all over with now? You know, yes, we have a lot more species than we did, but at least we can learn these and be satisfied they'll stay the same. No. Uh, and that is because as molecular mycology has developed, uh, it has been discovered that if you sequence three or four or five different pages, uh, you can get more detailed, precise information, kind of like uh, increasing the amplification of your binoculars or telescope or microscope. So a lot of things that weren't exactly clear from just using barcodes get progressively more clear uh, as you sample additional genes. Bike did sample multiple genes, but it's still not entirely clear where the species lines are with some of the chanterelles, as you will see soon. Um, but enough of that, let's talk about, let's go through the species. And I'm gonna start with the solid bodied chanterelles, genus cantharellus, uh, this is the list. This is, to the best of my knowledge right now, the entire list of uh, Cantharellus species occurring in the Southern Appalachians. Georgia has a few more that I'm not going to be able to talk about tonight because I don't know them and haven't seen them. Um, but at the end, uh, I'm going to give you, remind you of Michael Quo's website, Mushroom Expert. His key for Cantharellus um, and Craterellus has gotten pretty good over the years. He's got most everything I've got here and some of the others. For those of you that are new, there's a whole lot of names here. You have no chance, don't even try to remember all of them. Uh, look at the uh, bolded common names though. Uh, if you can get that far, you're doing pretty good. Uh, you're off to a great start. Uh, we're going to go through all of them, beginning with that first one on the list, which is a name you probably don't recognize because I made it up, uh, based on a new species that Bike described uh, called Cantharellus velotinus. Cantharellus velotinus is a really interesting one uh, because it is so variable in presentation. Uh, Bike doesn't like the fact that the mushrooms that you're going to see in the next slide all genetically, so far at least, seem to belong to this species because they look so different. But there is one way, simple way, to know this species when you see it regardless of what it looks like. And that is by looking at the surface of the cap and seeing that there are little fuzz ripples uh, in the cap surface. You see it in both of these here. You won't see it all over the cap surface, but if you see it anywhere up there, regardless of anything else, it's Cantharellus velotinus, job done for identification. A lot of chanterelles are slightly fuzzy if you have enough magnification to see it, but as the mushrooms mature, it doesn't break up into these ripple-like things uh, that actually become a little whiter as the mushroom dries. So it gets easier to see in old mushrooms than it is in young ones. If you see this, Cantharellus velotinus, even though it may look like any of these. Uh, the one you see in the middle, the pink one, uh, has been misidentified in field guides for 20 years. And uh, the reason that's the case is because of a molecular mycology screw up. Somebody submitted the DNA barcode for this mushroom um, to GenBank and called it Cantharellus persicinus, which it isn't. Uh, bike, it, it took Bike to figure this out uh, and correct the mistake. There is a Cantharellus persicinus. It's a tiny little chanterelle, you'll see it shortly, um, that Ron Peterson from Tennessee uh, described uh, 40 years ago or thereabouts. 
Uh, but due to the GenBank mistake in field guides, this species here, or, or this pink mushroom here gets called Cantharellus uh, persicinus. It isn't, it's velotinus. It's just a pink version. It has ripples in the cap, plenty of nice wrinkles underneath. This is also Cantharellus velotinus. It looks just like a golden chanterelle, well-developed ridges underneath the cap, but it has that ripple action going on in the fuzz on the upper surface. So that is just the quote unquote sibarioid form of Cantharellus velotinus. And over here, you have a yellow to orange version. Again, it's got the ripples on top, but underneath it's sanded off, almost looks smooth. So up until bike, this would have just gotten called Cantharellus lateritius and other species that we'll meet again shortly. Uh, but it isn't. Uh, genetically, it's Felotinus just like these others. Um, bike was pretty grumbly about having to call all these the same things. So at some point, we can imagine that there might be somebody else studying these with additional uh, genetic sequences and trying to find a way to separate these into different species. So far, it hasn't been done. So let's move from there to um, what's left of golden chanterelles as they once were. Uh, we have anywhere between two and four species of golden chanterelles, quote unquote, that may be a little bit fuzzy on the cap, but do not have ripples here. Two, one or two of those species, these two, Tanuathrix and Flavus, um, look identical, uh, both macroscopically and microscopically. Even Bart Bike can't tell them apart without a sequencer. Um, the characteristic that separates these from the ones in the slide you're going to see next is that the fertile surface, which is well developed here, is yellow. It's yellow in young mushrooms, it's yellow in old mushrooms, it doesn't change. So these are the golden, golden chanterelles now compared to this. Here's another one or two species that both occur, uh, or that occurs here. Uh, you have them just like we do. Here, it looks like a golden chanterelle from the top, but if you look at it from the side, the fertile surface is white when these mushrooms are young, and they pinken as the mushrooms get older. Um, Cantharellus phasmatus, uh, that uh, is basically ghost, uh, Latin for ghost. So if you want to call these the ghost golden chanterelles, you can. Once again, you can't tell phasmatus from deceptivus unless you have a, uh, a sequencer. So pick a name. If you are called upon to, uh, to give one, uh, but basically it's just a ghost golden chanterelle by whichever name you decide to call it. And no, you can't be believed. You're half, a, it's a coin flip. Are you right or not? Unless you've got a sequencer, you'll never know. Here's our friend Altapes again. Uh, this one looks just like a golden chanterelle, a golden, golden chanterelle. Got yellow uh, fertile surface here, nice wrinkles. Uh, the way you can tell this apart from the ones we've already talked about uh, is a, compar a comparison between the length of the stalk and the width of the cap. Most chanterelles are kind of squatty little things. Uh, the cap is going to be wider than the stalk is tall, often by quite a bit. Uh, in this case, the length of the stalk is often at least, if not greater, than uh, the length of the, of the cap width. So if you see that, other things being equal, it's going to be uh, probably Altapes or Septentrionalis, whoever wins the war to, to have the name. All of these species we've talked about so far are species you're going to find in deciduous woodlands. Um, you're not going to see a lot of this in uh, stands of pine, any of these that we've talked about so far. Uh, look for oaks, tulip poplars, hickories, the usual uh, run of the mill deciduous woods. Uh, and they can be fairly dry areas, fairly um, um, like ridge tops and, you know, kind of dry 
uh, areas. That's also true when we move to the smooth chanterelles. Uh, we've already seen one of them, the smooth form of Cantharellus velatinus. This is the first of the other two. This is Cantharellus lateritius. This name survived Bart Bike, uh, still belongs to this mushroom here. But now it has two, two lookalikes. One we've already seen, the, the other one we're going to see in the next slide. This, is, this can be a very large chanterelle. Um, here, it's often the biggest because of the flamboyance of this cap. Uh, these things uh, just keep going and going and going. The cap gets bigger, more folded, lobed, fluted, wrinkled, all sorts of stuff goes on. Um, I think of this as the Saturday night version of the smooth chanterelle. Uh, just exuberant, just so happy to be out and about. The undersurface is going to be smooth or relatively so. The color can vary from white to a little bit pink to yellow. Doesn't matter, just not very much of it there, kind of sanded off looking, and a really uh, wild and crazy cap. Compared to the Sunday morning golden chanterelle, um, hung over in church, whatever the reason, uh, the cap may still be a little bit uh, lobed and that kind of stuff, but it is nowhere near uh, as wild and crazy as lateritious. This is Cantharellus flavo lateritious. Uh, it tends to be a little bit smaller because the cap doesn't get anywhere near as big, uh, but still just as tasty as all the others. Something else you can see in this particular slide is this mushroom. It used to be thought that conjoined chanterelles were their own species. Uh, if you had mushrooms that were joined at the base or you had kind of this um, side bud sticking out here with another cap on it, uh, that was a species. Bike says, nah, that's just something chanterelles know how to do occasionally. Ignore that. If you need to get, find the name, look at the other characteristics and name it based on that. That's it for the smooth chanterelles and the kind of uh, dry deciduous woodland ones uh, for at least a little while. This is the cinnabar chanterelle. Um, in our part of the country, so far at least, knock on wood, uh, this is the same as it ever was. Bike did find a couple of other quote unquote cinnabar chanterelle species west of you. Texas, Arkansas, places like that. Uh, but so far they haven't been detected here, so we don't have to worry about them yet. Everything that looks kind of like this is gonna be a cinnabar chanterelle. This is about as orange as they get. A lot of times they're a lot redder than this and they're really easy to see. Beginning mushroomers have no more trouble seeing these than anybody else does. Uh, they tend to occur in dark, dank sort of bottomland areas, at least up where I live, that's where you find most of them oftentimes in moss banks, uh, around laurel thickets. Yes, there may be deciduous trees. There might be a pine tree or two around as well. Looks like there was uh, around this one maybe, around this group. For beginners, the problem with cinnabar chanterelle, which is a fairly small species, is telling it apart for sure from some little wax cap mushrooms that can be roughly the same color and size. You can make that distinction a couple of different ways. One thing you can do is you can just kind of squish the cap between your fingers. If it is really wet and uh, slickery, that's going to be a wax cap. If it's a little bit drier than that and maybe a little bit granular between your fingers, then it's this. However, if you wanted to eat this thing, uh, you've just wrecked your chances of doing that by smashing it. So a better way to distinguish the two is to look at the fertile surface. These things have well-developed ridges underneath. They often fork, as you can see here. And they also, if you look really close, you might be able to see these little kind of ladder rung things. 
These are called cross veins uh, that link adjacent uh, ridges. If you see that, uh, it's a chanterelle for sure. The wax caps that could be confused with this don't have forking gills. They have long ones, and then they have short ones that start from the cap margin and go partway in and stop, just stop, don't join the adjacent uh, long gill. And they don't have cross veins. Uh, so if you can see that, maybe you need uh, a little bit of magnification to do it if you've got small specimens. Uh, that's the way to tell cinnabarinus or cinnabar chanterelles from uh, the little wax caps. Um, here's another one that I find usually in kind of wet, dark woods. Um, sometimes with pines, this, this group here is under pines. You can see some needles, often in moss banks. This is the Appalachian chanterelle. It's kind of a medium-sized one, a little bit smaller than the Goldens, a little bit bigger usually than the Cinnabars. The distinguishing characteristic here is this brown cap center. You can see it here, here, maybe even a little bit here. Um, the fertile surface is once again really well developed, looks almost like gills. You've got the cross veins going there. Pay attention to the color. The color of those ridges is going to be yellow. It's going to stay yellow. It isn't going to turn pink or lavender or gray or anything like that. It's going to stay this color here. Appalachian chanterelles, though, do sometimes violate the stupid human rule of cantharellus mushrooms need to be solid body. These things, as they mature, tend to get hollow. And that hollow may even break through the center of the cap so that you have something that looks a lot like a craterellus, a trumpet mushroom that we're gonna be looking at shortly. Couple of distinctions, um, if you think about it at the time. One is that even when this thing does become tubular, the flesh is still gonna to tend to be thicker uh, than you see with the craterellus, number one. And number two, this yellow, um, fertile surface here. The others do not have a yellow fertile surface, at least when they're mature. Uh, and I'll introduce you to those shortly. These taste just as good as anything else does. Um, they don't tend to grow in profusion, at least I haven't seen, you know, fields full of them or woodlands full of them. Uh, but you can throw them in your basket with any of the others if you happen to find them. Here is the little peach chanterelle. This is the real Cantharellus persicinus. Uh, it is the size of a small chanterelle, uh, maybe just a shade bigger. You'll see that in the next slide. That's what I thought this was when I first found them uh, because they also tend to occur in really dark, dank areas where the sun don't shine. Uh, and so I didn't notice that this was pink until I got them home and uh, uploaded my photos uh, and saw that my photos also showed this pink uh, fertile surface here. This is the species that uh, Peterson described to name Persicinus. But since the peach chanterelle common name has gotten into such common popular usage, it's, it doesn't, it's not gonna happen that that uh, name, the, the common name gets transferred to this. So let's just call it the little peach chanterelle. You can eat it if you want, but a big one is gonna have a cap a diameter no bigger than a quarter and they're often smaller than that. Here is the real small chanterelle, um, which is the uh, maximum the size of a little peach chanterelle, oftentimes really tiny, maybe even only a couple of millimeters across the surface of the cap. See how big the moss is here compared to that cap. The fertile surface is yellow, not pink. Uh, so itty bitty tiny one in a moss bank, yellow fertile surface, it's gonna be Cantharellus minor. Um, I don't know anybody that really eats these as such, although um, as with uh, cinnabar chanterelles or maybe even little peach chanterelles, I do know people that collect these and put them in uh, with pickles just for a little spot of color that otherwise wouldn't be there. Now here's one uh, that you probably do not have in Georgia. In fact, it wasn't known from North Carolina 
or anywhere within a thousand miles of North Carolina until a couple of years ago when uh, some Asheville Mushroom Club people and uh, the Matheny Lab uh, folks started uh, inventorying species on top of Mount Mitchell and found this. This is the ugliest chanterelle I know of. I think there's general agreement on that among the people who've seen it. It's the size of a golden chanterelle, uh, but plug ugly, and they look kind of like bottle stoppers for a very long time, weeks. Uh, the cap eventually does spread out to more golden chanterelle size. Um, the top surface of the cap tends to develop some kind of brownish scales. Um, it may be Canth uh, Cantharellus camphoratus, a species known from the spruce fir region of southeastern Canada, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, uh, Maine, uh, but nobody had seen it anywhere near uh, our latitude until we found it on Mitchell, but in the same sort of habitat where they find it in Canada. Brandon's grad student, Rachel Sweeney, who some of you may know, uh, is, I think, uh, working this up and including it in her uh, PhD thesis. So at some point, uh, we will perhaps know whether this is the same as the one in Canada or which, or whether it's a new species. You're probably only going to see this in the spruce fir habitat. Uh, and to the best of my knowledge, all of those are fed land, more or less, uh, where you're not supposed to collect mushrooms anyway. I know one person, uh, not me, who sampled these, says they taste just like anybody else's chanterelle. Uh, so flavor-wise, there's no problem. Uh, and that concludes uh, the entire roster of known Cantharella species uh, in, in uh, Western North Carolina. And we can move on now to the trumpets, genus Craterellus. There are lots and lots of them, most of them very obscure. Uh, if you're new to mushrooming, these ones with common names are the ones to learn. Uh, because these are the ones that people look for uh, and the others are mostly either teeny tiny or don't smell right anyway and so save those for a year or two from now when you get uh, bored with uh, more common species. Only two are yellow or orange and we'll start with those. Everything else though is going to be pretty much some shade of brown, blue, black, gray, uh, that kind of thing. First on the list is the flame chanterelle, Craterellus ignicolor. This is real common. Again, deciduous woods. Um, you probably see that in a lot of, uh, a, a large part of Georgia, if not the whole state. Uh, this is the one of the ones that you could confuse with an Appalachian chanterelle because the upper surface of the cap is yellow. And if there had been a brown center there, it's all gone because it's hollowed out except in this species, it's meant to be hollowed out from the beginning, and so it is. The fertile surface here may start yellow in young specimens or yellowish, but then turns kind of pink or lavender as the mushroom matures. Um, they're relatively small usually, although uh, you can see uh, caps that are a couple inches across sometimes. Uh, they taste fine uh, when used fresh. They also dry out well, um, as you would imagine they would, because they're so thin, uh, thin flesh, paper thin, in fact. But at least my experience with doing that and rehydrating them is that you wind up with something that tastes a lot like paper. And so if I'm gonna eat these, I'm gonna do it with fresh mushrooms um, and not wait. Later on, we're gonna see another mushroom called the tubi. Craterellus uh, tubeiformis, uh, which also could get confused with this. But the cap surface there tends to be fairly distinctly brown from the very start. These things can get a little brassy colored on top, especially if they get old. Uh, but tubeiformis is brown uh, from the beginning. The fertile surface is also a different color. That's the one that has kind of grayish. Uh, or whitish gray fertile surface. It's about the same color as this, 
Uh, and Tubaeiformis is also more of a swampy or boggy sort of inhabitant. Um, it's a mostly northern species, but it is going to get down to Georgia some, uh, at least North Georgia. I don't know about further south than that. Uh, and Tubaeiformis can grow with conifers. On Mitchell, it's uh, spruce fir uh, is where you find it. Um, but I don't think it's restricted to that. It's, it's pretty wet areas, though. Here is a, is a fun one, and I think Georgia has a lot of these uh, from what I can determine, probably more than we do up here. Uh, I always like to take pictures of this when I find it because it's just so bizarre uh, compared to the body uh, plan of all the others we've talked about tonight. These are all hollow tubes all the way down to about here on this one, at least down to here. Uh, but they're joined in a kind of bulky solid base at the bottom, and all these tubes sprout from that. The outer surface is smooth in this species. Uh, you may have oh, 30 caps. I don't know how many are there. Uh, probably at least 30 uh, from the same base. The person that described this and named it Cantharellus odoratus, wrote it up as having a pleasant floral smell. I found this seven or eight times uh, and never have I encountered a pleasant floral smell. Either there is no smell um, or it smells like gym socks. I cooked it up once, it tasted like gym socks. So I don't cook it, I cook it up anymore. Uh, but I always take pictures of it whenever I see it. And if you've got a camera, I hope you will too. And now we can move to the drably colored uh, craterella species, but we'll begin with the one everybody goes wild for in the summer. Hello. Are we still there? Sam? Still fine. Oh, good. Okay, there was a bunch of weird electronic stuff going on in this end for a minute. Okay. Um, black trumpets. Black trumpets are highly sought after by everybody that likes to eat mushrooms, I think, or at least almost everybody. But for beginning mushroomers, they're almost impossible to see. It took me 18 months before I saw my first black trumpet, not because I hadn't walked past them a million times, but because I just didn't recognize what I was seeing when I saw it. Uh, beginning mushroomers are told to look for these in moss banks, which is a good idea because um, that brown or black does stand out against green moss. Um, these things can be uh, as much as a couple of inches tall, maybe a little taller even. When they're young, they tend to be long and skinny like this but then the cap flares out and it's hollow all the way down to the base. The problem is these things look like dead leaves just happen, that are happened to be lying on moss. Uh, unless you really stop and look closely and see that these things are hollow tubes. Once you get your head wrapped around that idea, these are not hard to see. But until you do, they're almost impossible to see. Once you get good at finding them in moss banks, then you can look for them out in the woods. Again, deciduous uh, woods. They can grow in clumps like this. Um, they often grow, you know, there might be five or six at least within a foot or two radius. Occasionally you get a little clump like this. Uh, but out in the woods in just the general leaf litter, these are even harder to see than they are against the green. So learn them here first. And then uh, once you find a moss bank that's got some of these, uh, explore the woodlands around there uh, because there might be more. These, to me, a single black trumpet has no smell. If I find a bag full of them and put my nose in that, there's the pleasant floral uh, scent. A lot of these together will make, uh, it's like a bag of flowers. That smell, for me at least, does not, trans, uh, does not survive cooking. 
uh, black trumpets have a definite taste, but it isn't a flowers. Compared with this mushroom here, uh, which looks a lot like a black trumpet, um, the outer surface is a little bit different in that it's paler, number one. And number two, you can see that there are some pretty distinct ridges up here uh, in the upper part of this. The inner surface looks like perfectly good for black trumpet, but the flesh of this one is thicker. Uh, this is like cardboard thick. The others are paper thin. Uh, this is definitely meatier as trumpets go. Um, this is the fetid trumpet, uh, who the person that described this didn't like the odor. He thought it was gem socks. Uh, to me, this smells like a whole bag. One of these smells like a whole bag full of black trumpets. Uh, since I like that smell, it comes through nicely for me at least, um, I might add one of these to a recipe because the floral smell does survive cooking and whatever you've got it in is likely to taste a little flowery uh, at the end of the day. So probably not hamburger, uh, but peas might be a good idea. Um, they're not as common, at least around where I live, uh, by any means, as black trumpets are. Uh, but if you find one uh, and you like the smell, uh, feel free to take it home and cook it up. These are pretty uncommon, whatever they are. Uh, there is disagreement uh, right now about what to call this. Uh, there are supposed to be microscopic differences between these two species and the one you're going to see next, um, but we're waiting on Rachel Sweeney uh, to actually do the DNA on all of these and tell us what the real answer is. Um, this one is probably either Craterella cinereus or venosus. Microscopically, they are supposed to differ by how many spores are on each basidium. Uh, and with chanterelles, that's often a weird number. It's usually not four. It can be five or six or seven or uh, something other than a nice multiple of two. This uh, here um, usually forms dense clumps. It's kind of like mounds sometimes in very dark, damp places. Uh, this uh, group here is found in the middle of a laurel thicket. Uh, where the sun hasn't probably shown in decades, if not 100 years. Uh, so it's interesting to take a picture of this uh, if you do find it. Notice that although it looks like a black trumpet from the top or a clump of black trumpets, the outer surface here, the fertile surface, is kind of blue-gray uh, and well wrinkled all the way down. Uh, this has the gym socks smell to it. Um, I don't know anybody that thinks this smells good. Um, and although this has been cooked up at Purchase Knob a time or two, uh, when we found this up there, uh, everybody pretty much agrees it doesn't taste good. Uh, so whether Cenarius or Venosis, uh, it's probably something to leave there if you happen to find it. Here is something else uh, that's kind of in the same ballpark, although the color is definitely different. Uh, young ones tend to be pretty pale, kind of uh, parchmenty colored like this, or vellum colored. Uh, they can get darker brown, especially if um, they're damp. The fertile surface is usually really well developed and can be wrinkled all the way down to the ground. Uh, remember the chanterelle look like uh, that was wrinkled all the way to the ground. That was a solid mushroom. This one is not. It really is hollow all the way down. I only know of one place where this grows, at the base of one particular tulip poplar tree way up on a ridge. Uh, it is a fairly dry area, completely different than the place where uh, those ones in the previous slide are found. Uh, this is not dark and damp. This is kind of dry and windy. Um, it does smell like gym socks. It tastes like gym socks. This is another one, Rachel uh, and Brandon at UT are trying to get um, a molecular name for. Maybe it'll be Cerula fuscus. Uh, Brandon uh, thinks it might be um, Craterellus dubius, which is a Canadian species. 
that is always written up as occurring around spruces. There's not a spruce within a half a mile of this. Uh, so we rate, wait uh, Rachel's thesis uh, to figure out what it really is. If you are lucky enough to find this, uh, please do take pictures, take notes, put it up on Mushroom Observer, um, send samples to uh, the Matheny Lab at UT in Knoxville, uh, because this, whatever it is, is really, really, really not very well known at all uh, so far. Now we'll go back to one that uh, beginners might look for uh, and everybody else that likes craterellus mushrooms in the skillet will too. This is the Tubi, craterellus tubi, tubea formis. They could be confused with craterellus in color or maybe with the Appalachian chanterelle, but notice the difference in the color of the cap here. This is really brown. Uh, it can be almost chocolate brown in some. Uh, and the fertile surface, isn't pink, it isn't lavender, it isn't yellow. It's kind of a grayish or grayish white color with a yellow stalk uh, and is hollow. This I have only seen in boggy areas. Um, the easiest place to find it is a particular seep up on top of Mount Mitchell, but uh, I've also seen it elsewhere. It's usually wet areas, conifers around a lot of the time. So this one doesn't really uh, necessarily obey the rules of, of being in deciduous woods. Uh, and we'll close out with a series now of obscurities, uh, some of which have good names, some don't, uh, and most people never see them at all, be, uh, partly because they are so tiny. This one here, this is the only one I've ever seen. Uh, it was in a mossy area in a, in a bottom land uh, near the, uh, the bank of a creek. Um, it looks kind of like a tubi in that it has a brown cap, but it also has a brown stalk, not a yellow one or an orange one. The fertile surface is white. Uh, this works out in keys pretty well for uh, Craterella subundulatus, except that it's too big. Uh, this thing might be an inch and a half tall, and that's twice as high as Subundulatus was described as being. Uh, unfortunately, this one has been lost to science, so Rachel can't, uh, can't really sequence it. Um, if you find something tiny like this, for some reason, again, take good pictures, take good notes, uh, and uh, see if Brandon Matheny would like to have it for his herbarium collection at UT. Here's a Peterson species that I personally have never seen. I don't have great eyesight. This thing is also less than an inch tall. Um, Craterellus hessleri, Peterson named it. Here's his original illustration uh, in the descriptive uh, article. Notice that unlike the other Craterellus species, this one is a really wide kind of sugar cone sort of tube, uh, hollow all the way to the bottom. Django Grootmeyers, who some of you may know, I don't, uh, put this picture up on Mushroom Observer. So here it is in the flesh. Uh, looks like it's on a mud bank of some kind, really tiny. Uh, I don't believe his colors here though. I think he must have shot this with his flash. So get rid of that kind of golden hue. It's, this is probably closer to what it's gonna look like in natural light. Uh, but there's the size. Notice that it's really wide open, uh, pretty much all the way down uh, to the ground at least. Here's the opposite take uh, on something that's really tiny. Uh, this again is a Peterson species described from Tennessee, but uh, and maybe actually fairly common. It's just that almost nobody ever sees it. Uh, it's less than an inch tall. Uh, and it looks like a leaf petiole, uh, the, the stem of a dead leaf just sticking up out of the ground. Uh, this is Craterellus carolinensis, uh, and this is another rule breaker. This is the Craterellus that has the solid stalk all the way down until you get up to about here. Then it flares. Um, you're going to need a uh, 10x uh, loop, probably, 
to be able to figure out what this is at all. But at 10X, you'll see that it has a hairy fringe on the, on the cap that's really pronounced with a 10X uh, loop. Um, if you find this, you were probably bent over looking at something else and then just happened to see this growing alongside. That's how uh, Frank Bartuka, who's an Asheville club member, found these two at Purchase Knob. He was hoping it was a cordyceps, so he dug them all up real deeply. Uh, didn't find any truffles, didn't find any bugs, but did bring them back. Uh, and then once we had a look at them, uh, it was clear that it was Craterellus carolinensis. This is one, I don't know if even pictures, uh, yeah, you could, but it's not gonna make a pretty picture. It's just gonna be there. Um, you will have seen it, you will have documented that, uh, but that's probably all there is to Craterellus carolinensis. And that's all there is to the species list. Uh, thank goodness uh, for those of you uh, who were suffering along through those obscurities. Back to beginners for a minute. Um, these are all chanterelles. And assuming that you know for sure that they are chanterelles and not guild mushrooms, this is the way they're probably gonna look in your kitchen too. You're gonna mix and match the species, uh, cook them all up together, and that's perfectly fine. They're all gonna have that nice chanterelle flavor to them. All of these orange yellow ones at least are. Uh, and so go to it. And for the last slide, uh, something for those of you that have been at this a while, uh, three uh, keys uh, for how to figure out which is which. Uh, the first one, I think Sam has given you the link to on the Asheville Mushroom Club website. Uh, I've done a key that includes everything you've seen tonight with the exception of the whatever it is up on top of Mount Mitchell, the uh, um, camphoratus or whatever it is. Everything else is there. Um, sometimes you have to get microscopic to uh, tell what's what and some of the names may change after Rachel does a bar bike job on uh, genus Craterellus. Uh, Mushroom Expert um, has a good key now, uh, in fact, a really nice key for uh, Craterellus and Cantharellus. He includes most of the things I've got here uh, and also some that I don't. So some of the Georgia specialties that I didn't cover tonight may be available on his website. And if you really get uh, hot and bothered by um, Craterellus oddities, the old Bigelow key from 1978 um, is a good one. <clears throat> that's where you'll find things like Cerulio Fuscus and some of the other real oddballs. Uh, if you're that far into it, you know about Cyber Lever, so uh, just find Bigelow's uh, 78 key in Mycologia, uh, and you're off to the races. Uh, and with that, I think I will leave the slide up so that if anybody's writing, they can keep writing. But I want to turn it back over to Sam uh, so we can see if there were any questions, and if so, if there are any answers. Okay. So let me go back in the chat. All right, thank you, Mike. That was wonderful. And really one of my favorite things is you showing that cross-section slice of the difference between ridges and gills. That was brilliant. I haven't seen anyone illustrate it that way, so I love that um, very practical way to tell. And, uh, yes, it is. 